you know, growing up in, uh, you know, a tiny town was kind of rough on me. You know, I, I had this undiagnosed genetic disorder, uh, and also, um, you know, I, w- I was gender non-conforming, and I was, you know, we were like the only Jewish family in town, <laughs> and my parents were vegetarian hippies, and it like, <laughs> let's say there was like a lot, um, there was a lot for bullies to work with there, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was the 80s, we weren't really talking about bullying in schools the same way that we that we are now, so, you know, a lot, so... You know, they they tell me like, oh, you know, they're picking on you because they can see they're getting to you. So I was, you know, so I took that to mean like, you know, hide weakness at all costs. Hey there, and welcome to In Sickness and In Health, a podcast about chronic illness, disability, medical traumas, and everyday uncomfortable healthcare experiences. My name is Kara Gale. I'm not a doctor or a medical professional. I'm just a person and a patient who really wants to talk about this stuff more. Nothing said on this show should ever be considered medical advice. If you're experiencing a medical issue, please seek qualified medical help. I know the system sucks, but I do wish you a lot of luck. Every person is different, even within disease groups, so none of my guests should ever be regarded as official representatives or spokespersons for their conditions. Please respect their very personal choices, and unless they ask for it, please don't make suggestions about treatments or lifestyle changes. Unsolicited medical advice is never not annoying. Among several other important causes, May is Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome Awareness Month. And this EDS Awareness Month is especially exciting because as I record this, experts from around the world are gathered in New York City for the Ehlers-Danlos Society's International Symposium, working to reclassify the diagnostic criteria for all the types of EDS. This symposium is also purposed with producing guidelines for medical professionals to use once a diagnosis has been reached as a universal guide for management. This is a very big deal for those of us in the EDS community. The last time the diagnostic criteria was officially revised was in 1997. And for those of us for whom it seems like 1997 wasn't that long ago, it's actually been almost 20 years. We've learned a lot over those two decades, not only about EDS and many of its secondary conditions, but about medical science in general. I can't wait to see what comes of this symposium. Having treatment guidelines for practitioners will also be really exciting because so many of us get diagnosed, and after the excitement or terror of finally having a diagnosis settles, we and our non-EDS expert doctors get a serious case of the oh shit, what nows. So many of us remain undiagnosed for so long. I myself spent two decades wondering what was wrong with me. Today's guest, Rebecca, wasn't diagnosed until they were 28. Last Friday, April 29th, was Undiagnosed Day, a day of awareness for those with health issues that have yet to be diagnosed. I spent the day tweeting some thoughts and episodes of the podcast that have featured stories of diagnostic limbo, and you can find a link to the Storyfy of those tweets on the episode page. Today's episode is actually a rerun of episode three. I'm sorry, but my chronic pain and fatigue associated with my own EDS is really killing me this week. But I love this interview. It makes me laugh a lot, and it's really a great introduction to what it means for so many of us to live with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. The original episode was part of the dysautonomia series we launched the podcast with back in October, where I talked to five different dysautonomia patients who have POTS because of different primary diagnoses. Check them out if you haven't heard them yet. As I mentioned at the top, May is also the awareness month for a lot of other conditions and causes. I called this episode Fill-in-the-Blank Awareness Month, kind of as a jerky joke, but also a pretty accurate one. Awareness fatigue is definitely a thing, and simply being aware of any given illness isn't particularly helpful, and I understand why many people think awareness months, weeks, or days are useless. They don't address issues of healthcare access, accessibility, or any of the other day-to-day challenges of real patients. But for organizations with limited resources, especially for conditions that are still very poorly understood or no one's ever heard of, a concentrated push for awareness is an efficient way of raising the profile of these causes. 
to move forward in dealing with these illnesses every other month of the year. After all, a condition can't get research funding or attention if no one knows it's actually a thing. Among the awareness causes featured this month are lupus, which Sirena talked about in episode 13, fibromyalgia, which is a condition of central sensitization, which we talked about in episode 11 and several other episodes, MECFS, which I talked a little bit about in last week's episode 29 and hope to cover more of in future episodes, mental health, which has come up in several episodes, but which Dior talked about specifically in episode 12, and Heather talked about in episode 21. Lyme disease, which we talked about a bit in episode 24, and we'll talk about more in the future. Arthritis, various forms of which have come up in several episodes, including episodes 5, 10, 11, 21, 22, 23, and 27, and tuberous sclerosis complex, which episode 25 guest Nikki has, and we'll talk about more in a future episode that contains the second half of our interview. Many of these conditions disproportionately affect women and are very often dismissed by doctors and people around us as hysterical manifestations of psychological issues. That's another thing that comes up a lot on the podcast, and as we always mention, is total bullshit. That's the reason I do this show, to continue the conversations about these conditions outside of their awareness months, and to have open and honest dialogues about what they mean for the people they affect, and that they are, in fact, real. I wish we didn't have to keep saying over and over and over again that these conditions are real and deeply affect the lives of those who live with them, but that's the world that we live in, and that's why we'll keep talking about it. Speaking of bodily functions that the larger culture likes to pretend don't exist, May 28th is Menstrual Hygiene Day. If you're in the New York City area, I'll be at Periodic Inc.'s NYC Red Party talking to people about periods, one of my favorite things, and they'll have food, fun activities, samples of products and services, and a huge silent auction style raffle. And I'm making fun stickers, so you should definitely come. They're also hosting a similar event in Portland, Oregon, if you're in that area. You can find links to the episodes I've mentioned, the red parties, and other stuff we talk about in this episode on the show page. As always, find resources and more from us at insignispod.com and on social media at insignispod. If you can, please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes, which helps other people find the show. And for those of you unfamiliar with EDS, I'm going to let Rebecca explain a bit about the condition now. Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is a group of uh, genetic disorders of connective tissue formation and metabolism. Uh, usually it's collagen for us, definitely for the most, uh, the most common types, which are hypermobility and the classical variation. Um, so in most cases, it's going to show itself with dislocating unstable joints, either like complete dislocations or partial dislocations, which are called subluxations. Uh, so we have a lot of, um, we can have muscle spasms, uh, which is the body's way of compensating for those instabilities. And we also, um, are very prone to injury. So whether it's like small repeated micro tears in the muscle or in tendons and ligaments, or if it's, you know, tendonitis or like actual, you know, complete tears, sprains, strains, um, <laughs> all kinds of fun injuries. And uh, so <laughs> I guess it probably um, goes without saying that that can cause all kinds of chronic pain and also kind of progressive disability. Most people uh, are with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome also show some um, disorder of the autonomic nervous system, which is called dysautonomia. And one of the more common types of that is POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So that means that when you uh, are changing position, like to get upright, to stand up, 
your blood tends to pool uh, either in the abdomen or in the legs and feet, um, which causes uh, tachycardia as a response, and sometimes syncope, which is a you know fancy medical way of saying passing out, it can be very disabling. Um, it can also come with all sorts of uh, gastrointestinal problems, like gastroparesis, which is delayed gastric emptying, um, or no gastric emptying in really severe cases, uh, and uh, food allergies are really common. Um, and these are all things I struggle with. Um, it's it's really an adventure. <laughs> Uh, our bodies are a wonderland. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. Um, oh, and I didn't even get into the immune derangement mm. or, uh, you know, what happens to your cervical spine and brain over time, um, causing all kinds of uh, kind of secondary neurological complications. <laughs> Um, you know, so it was a really, it was kind of an interesting mix of approaches. So like I mentioned, you know, we were vegetarian and kind of crunchy and my mom ran a food co-op out of our garage um, and was like a natural childbirth instructor. So, you know, so we went to the health food store and, you know, my immune system was awful. So we'd take, you know, echinacea and golden seal and my stomach was always hurting. So that was papaya enzymes. But at the same time, you know, she also took me to the doctor. So it wasn't like they were depending entirely on these, you know, kind of natural remedies um, or non-remedies, as the case may be. Um, You know, so it was definitely like kind of a comprehensive approach. But, you know, my my parents really trusted the doctors. So, you know, when the doctors said, like, uh, you know, they're okay, there's nothing wrong with them. (laughs) <laughs> my parents, you know, believed them, which was, you know, kind of reasonable, I guess. You know, we're really, we're trained to kind of respect authority and, you know, believe doctors and respect their credentials. Right. Um, but, you know, that, that might not work when you have a rare disease. Yeah. So, you know, so even though I was, like, sick frequently, um, you know, and would be missing school, like, I definitely, you know, got in the habit of uh, reducing my own dislocations and, you know, I got very adept at wrapping my sprained ankles with ace bandages on my own. Um, you know, also just because, you know, the doctors that I saw weren't particularly helpful either. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like there was, by the time I was hitting puberty, it was pretty clear that there was something wrong with me, but they didn't know what it was. Right. <laughs> you know, so eventually, like, I just stopped going to the doctors because I assumed that they couldn't help me. And they really couldn't at that point. Um, I would need a diagnosis for that to happen. You know, a good, like, kind of culminating point was when I was, I think I was 10 or 11, and I was homesick with the flu for the, you know, zillionth time that year. Um you know, and, and keep in mind that I wasn't diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome until I was 28. Mm-hmm. So for a long time, it was just kind of mysterious. Uh, but, you know, I was home, sick, you know, homesick with my parents, and I, you know, I asked them, Mom, Dad, am, am I a sickly child? You know, because I'd read a lot of Victorian <laughs> children's literature. Yeah. <laughs> and they were like, no, no, you're not. But, but that was a lie, too. So I, right. I, I think that there was just, like, a lot of, A lot of denial, (laughs) a lot of kind of like, you know, filtering my experiences through uh, the very limited (laughs) portrayals uh, of chronic illness that I saw in children's literature. And, I mean, you really didn't want to be like Colin from The Secret Garden. That was exactly who I was thinking about. (laughs) Yeah, you you didn't want to be him, but I was really afraid I was him. (laughs) What have you been diagnosed with, and what exactly does that mean for you? Okay, so um, the genetic disorder that I've been uh, referring to is Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, uh, most, possi- most probably the classical subtype, though possibly the hypermobility subtype, and it'll probably all be changed next summer anyway, so I'm not too caught up on the specifics. Right, because they're um, doing an <laughs> international symposium where they're planning to rewrite the diagnostic criteria and probably redo yeah, we'll, the typing. <laughs> we'll all get reshuffled, probably. Right. Um, which is, it's actually a good thing. Oh, um, I'm super psyched about it. Yeah, yeah, we're way overdue. 1998 or 97, I think, was the, the last round, right? Yeah. Um, so anyway, so along with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, um, I also have uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, 
um, gastroparesis, uh, mast cell activation syndrome. Um, I think I think those are the big ones. Yeah. Um, oh, and I have general generalized anxiety disorder and post traumatic stress disorder. Oh, that's uh, a fun combo. Yeah, totally. Um, and I mean, I've had anxiety disorders in the past. Yeah. Uh, that I don't seem to have anymore. Like I seem to have outgrew my obsessive compulsive disorder, which is great. Like I'll take it. I, you know, I have enough already. Yeah. Um, and let me think what else. Yeah. And then there's like, you know, just all the, you know, all the like really secondary stuff, like, you know, temporomandibular joint disorder and tinnitus and um, cervical myelopathy and, uh, cervical radiculopathy and, you know, many, many herniated discs. And I think I have a tear in my right shoulder right now. I'm going uh, for an MRI on Wednesday. But, like, that's life with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Right. Like, it's kind of, you know, one thing after another. Like, you triage the most urgent problem and just kind of, like, live with the rest in the meantime. I always say it's like playing whack-a-mole. Yes. Like, every time yes. I address one issue, <laughs> I'm like, oh, sweet wait a minute, what's this other thing that's been here this whole time? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. and, like, you know, the things that, like, other people think are the biggest issues aren't, like, really... So, uh, I mean, to be very blunt here, um, I used to have, like, diarrhea all day, every day. Oh, (laughs) please, talk as much about diarrhea as you want. If if I could do a poop cast, I would. (laughs) I will be be a guest on your poop cast. I I have much to say about poop. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so getting to the point where I wasn't waking up at like, you know, between three and 5 a.m. every morning and crapping my brains out was like seriously like the biggest improvement in quality of life that oh, I yeah, like ever experienced. Um, you know, it's, it's those little things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You, know, so, you know, someone might have thought it was my patellar maltracking, you know, because that was, you know very painful and very obvious. No, no, it was the pooping. Yeah. It, was, it was the pooping. <laughs> yeah, I mean, being woken up out of your slumber to have diarrhea is not my idea of a good time. No, you don't want to start your day that way. <laughs> no, um, definitely not. Yeah, but, you know, and really just, like, getting my body kind of to the point where I could, like, leave my house again and, like, show up to things on, like, a semi-reliable basis <laughs> has been huge. Um like, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome has just been a lot of, like, ups and downs with me. Um, and, you know, I'm, like, pretty clear on the fact that, like, you know, we're, we're going downhill. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, it would be, like, something major happens, and then I get treated, and I, you know, I get a bit better, but not totally better. And then something else happens, <laughs> and I get treatment, and I get a bit better, but not totally better. Right. So I'm just kind of, like, accumulating, like, diagnoses over the years. Um, but there, you know, there was like a point where I wasn't able, you know, when my, I, I developed symptoms of postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or I should say it got a lot worse, like very suddenly. Mm-hmm. And that was super hard to learn to cope with. Yeah. Um, and that's what actually, uh, you know, got me out of normal employment. Um, cause I couldn't get off my couch for a while yeah. and just, you know, finding the right meds finding the right assistive devices was huge. And, you know, also just learning to pace myself and, you know, know that if I need to be somewhere, you know, on Wednesday, it means I need to, like, not do anything, like, starting on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a learning curve for sure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think, like, we become, we really become experts in self-management, yeah. And I'd like to see, you know, more respect for that and more mm-hmm. studying that uh, coming from the medical field. Like, I think that if they listen to patients more. <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> maybe that would be helpful. You know, the literature wouldn't be, you know, like in the case of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, the literature always seems to be at least like five years behind right. what patients know. Right. And as far as doctors are concerned, they get one, maybe two slides on it in medical school that's like, okay, so here's Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. These are all the types. Here's some symptoms that are associated with it. And it just groups them all together. 
Yep. And then they move <laughs> on to something else, you know. So I hear constantly from other people who are kind of exploring the diagnosis. My doctor told me that I couldn't possibly have EDS because my skin isn't stretchy enough. Verbatim yeah. from different people with different doctors. But oh yeah, because doctors learn in medical school like <laughs> Ehlers Danlos syndrome equals extremely stretchy skin. And that's the thing that sticks out in their mind, and that's what they remember. So when a patient presents with what actually are the symptoms of ehlers danlos <laughs> syndrome, which I'm not saying that stretchy skin isn't. Obviously, it is specifically associated with the classical type. But, you know, most of us have the hypermobile type. So if they're presenting with all of the other symptoms and you tell them they can't possibly have it because they don't have stretchy skin, it's such a disservice because then that sends that person back out into the world still wondering what the hell is wrong with me. You know? Yeah. I mean, I think also like there's a tendency for, you know, whoever picks the photos that go in medical textbooks, oh, yeah. you know, like let's find the most extreme case, exactly. you know, and this is a spectrum disorder. <laughs> like mm-hmm. some of us are mildly hypermobile. Some of us are extremely hypermobile, but like actually hypermobility doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the severity of the complications you're going right. to experience. Like, I mean, it, it, it does for joints, but someone who's, you know, whose joints are only, you know, very mildly hypermobile could still have, you know, one of the associated problems like, you know, Chiari malformation right. or, you know, an aortic aneurysm. Or even POTS, which can be extremely disabling. Yeah. And I actually, I heard from a POTS doctor, you know, he had, or, you know, nominally a POTS expert who I saw when I was initially, you know, diagnosed with POTS because... You know, the people who diagnosed me couldn't, you know, couldn't tell me anything about treating it because they didn't know anything about treating it. Um, (laughs) So I went to this guy and, you know, I rode like, you know, several hours in the car, which was very uncomfortable. And then waited a really long time in his waiting room, which was also really uncomfortable. (laughs) So anyway, so, you know, what this, you know, supposed POTS expert, you know, does is he comes in and he starts... uh, trying to evaluate me for hypermobility. But, you know, and I'm like, uh, well, you know, I prefer not to hyperextend my joints. Uh, my other doctors have told me not to. Um, you know, the only reason you'd be doing it, you know, I figured the only reason you'd be doing it would be if he, like, you know, actually was doubting the validity of my EDS diagnosis. Mm-hmm. But so anyway, I'm like, why are you doing this? And he's like, well, you know, something about severity of hypermobility correlates with severity of POTS. That's not true. No, that's not. That's definitely not true. And if, like, these are the doctors who are, you know, presenting themselves as the expert in the condition, I'm really, really worried about... You know, yeah, I, I hear that a lot from a lot of people who are seeing quote-unquote experts who are clearly not. Like, who, who said you were an expert? You? <laughs> yeah. So you actually got diagnosed with POTS after your EDS diagnosis. Mine was the opposite. I got diagnosed with EDS after getting diagnosed with POTS and being like, why do I have this thing? Yeah. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about your diagnostic process and how that unfolded? Oh, my goodness. Yes, I would love to tell you about my, my diagnostic process. So basically, um, let's say I'm not very good at sports, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really stubborn <laughs> Uh, which has actually served me really well as a person with a chronic illness. Yeah. Um, so I, um, you know, I was really stubborn and I decided I was going to be a runner. So, you know, I ran and ran and I actually got pretty good at it, you know, through stubbornness. Like I'm not very fast, but my endurance was good. Um, and, you know, I was really good at ignoring like the searing pains in my bones uh, every time my foot hit the ground. Uh, so I had like a, um, a running accident, uh, which in retrospect was probably, um, a sacroiliac dislocation, Mm -hmm. uh, that compressed my, um, sciatic nerve. Yeah. Um, so it was most likely like a sacroiliac dislocation resulting in sciatic nerve compression. But, uh, of course we didn't really know that at the time because no one expects you to dislocate your sacroiliac joint. Right. You know, so I, I went for this run and, you know, something didn't feel right. So I cut it short and I went home and, you know, as the day, you know, I tried to stretch it out, but as the day went on, it got to the point where I literally couldn't sit down without like terrible excruciating pain. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was on, it was on a holiday weekend. The next Monday I went to see the doctor. 
I was treated with NSAIDs, which it later turned out I was allergic to. Oh, good. And muscle relaxants, uh, which it later turned out were really bad for me because they, uh, you know, without my muscles holding my joints in place, the joints don't really have anything holding them in place. Mm -hmm. Um, So anyway, like, I basically uh, did not get better over the next six weeks like they expected me to. So they sent me to physical therapy. Uh, Oh, yeah, and I also had an MRI that showed herniated discs, but none that could actually correspond to the problems I was having, (laughs) Um, of course. So, uh, you know, eventually I got in to see a physical therapist, and during the initial evaluation, she said, wow, you're really hypermobile in some areas, uh, and your muscles are are hypotonic in some places, but hypertonic in others. So... I go home, and I don't know what any of these words mean, so I look it up on the computer. And, you know, I look up hypermobility, and it says, you know, usually benign. However, you know, if you also have all these other uh, (laughs) problems that you have, it could be a sign of a hereditary connective tissue disorder, such as Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Um, And at that point, you know, the light really went off for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, because I'd been you know, really dealing with a lot of, like, health challenges and, like, just general fatigue and, you know, feeling yucky and irritable bowel syndrome stuff for a really long time. And, you know, I tried to, like, self-treat with, uh, you know, ridiculous diet and excessive exercise, which, you know, kind of got me part of the way there. But I felt like I was working, like, you know, ten times as hard to be half as healthy as your average person. Yeah, I went through the exact same thing. (laughs) I wonder how many of us do. (laughs) Right? Like, maybe if I just eat this really, really restrictive diet and exercise (laughs) constantly, I'll be okay. Yeah, definitely. Because it's all our fault. Right. Like, you know, and if you do gain weight, they'll blame any pain on the Mm -hmm. weight gain. Like, oh, you should lose weight. But but I'm gaining weight because I'm on Lyrica for my pain and it causes weight gain. (laughs) So, yeah, so I'm one of, like, the dreaded people who, like, diagnosed myself off the internet but in my case I was 100% correct and a lot of times people are I mean if you have the skills to be able to evaluate information and verify information like diagnosing yourself is not necessarily a bad thing I have done that with just about (laughs) every correct diagnosis that I have and it's not like I just (laughs) diagnosed myself and started self-treating I diagnosed myself and then brought it to a doctor who was then able to verify that diagnosis oh yeah same here I definitely don't recommend like you know treating yourself based on your own diagnosis but like you know, doctors don't necessarily have these rare things on their mind. Right. Or, yeah. But, you know, for me, it was just, like, so, like, beautifully specific. Mm-hmm. You know, it was talking about, like, a narrow palate. And I had, you know, I had had to have a palate expander when I was a kid. And, you know, this the, the scars, you know, which I was just, you know, covered in. And, you know, and I, I felt, like, really, really self-conscious of my scars mm-hmm. for so much of my life because, you know, they're stretch marks. So I was like, oh, it's because I'm fat. You know, I have these terrible stretch marks. No, I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's <laughs> – it was just very weird to kind of, you know, type in a word to Google and, like, see a description of the rare – genetic disorder that you have it's like (laughs) stepping into the like back of the closet and entering (laughs) yeah totally um and you know one thing i did do was i very quickly got involved in the online patient community Mm -hmm. um you know and they you know and they were very helpful and encouraging um during that initial quest to get a diagnosis uh, you know, and I definitely saw some people who could not help me, uh, during that time. <laughs> um, but you know, with the help of like all these other people who'd gone through this ridiculous process, I was, you know, they, they helped me keep my spirits up and, uh, you know, and there was always this fear in the back of my head that, you know, I was being a hypochondriac and I didn't actually mm-hmm. have this, um, you know, especially cause you know, some of the doctors I saw, you know, trying to find out if I had it, you know, really, you know, didn't seem particularly impressed. Right. <laughs> but, it, you know, 
but no, I, I mean, I really do have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Um, and then being involved in the online patient community uh, was great because, you know, I knew what was happening when I suddenly fell apart because of POTS. Right. Like, I knew the symptoms of POTS. Um, I'm going yeah. through that right now, like with gastroparesis. <laughs> I've had minor symptoms of it for several years, and I just had a stomach virus earlier this month. And afterwards, I'm like, oh, oh, this is gastroparesis. <laughs> I know exactly what's happening, and it's miserable. <laughs> yup, yup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think you also have mast cell activation syndrome. Yeah. Um, and that's just one that, like, I've really, like, had symptoms of that since I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And... You know, that I just attributed to general sickness. Uh, But, you know, that was, you know, really kind of, you know, it's still a very, like, cutting-edge diagnosis, Um, you know, still, like, finding acceptance. But, you know, it was all over the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome message boards, you know, several years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know, it was actually really uh, pretty easy to identify that that was you know, what was driving, like, a huge portion of my symptoms that weren't, you know, necessarily, like, this bone's out and this nerve is squished. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah, there's just Getting so treated. much tertiary weird stuff that happens. <laughs> yeah. By the way, getting treated for mast cell activation syndrome was what uh, saved me from the 3 a.m. poop emergency. Yeah, me too. I mean, I wasn't having 3 a.m. poop emergencies. I was just having poop emergencies at random times throughout the day. But Yep. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> huge improvement in quality of life. Yeah. Um, and now I just kind of feel like I'm, you know, in the groove with that. Like I'm pretty, you know, my my spouse and I joke about it that, you know, that I I really like I have a pretty good track record right now of calling my diagnoses. Yeah. Was there anything that you were super surprised to find out wasn't normal? <laughs> <laughs> because for me, it was literally everything. Literally everything. Yeah. Literally everything. Um, well, it was like, it was pretty much divided between like, oh, that's not normal. And oh, that's not a personal failing. <laughs> so it's actually really good for my self-esteem to find out I had yeah. a terrible disorder. Right. Yeah. Like there's a reason for all of this. <laughs> there's a reason it's that nothing seems to work the way it should. How many suggestions did you get that maybe this actually wasn't something physical and was somehow psychosomatic? Did did you face that at all? Oh, yeah. I mean, the muscle spasms in my shoulders are totally my stress and not um, my muscles trying their hardest to hold my head on. Um, <laughs> and... Yeah, and there was there was a point when I was in my 20s where I was just... Um, I became you know, extremely fatigued and I was sleeping like 16 hours a day and, or I guess 14 hours a day. Cause I had to commute to work and back cause I, I was still working at that point or trying to, um, you know, so I was sleeping basically like all the time I wasn't at work and I was, you know, starting to experience, you know, pain in my hands and, um, dizziness when I stood upright, that might sound familiar to anyone who has dysautonomia. Um, you know, so I went to the doctor and, you know, they asked me all these questions about, you know, what was going on in my life. And, you know, at the time my dad was being treated for cancer. So they were like, oh, clearly this is just depression yeah. because, you know, because of the stresses in your life. Um, and, you know, the thing is they put me on an antidepressant and I felt better. Uh, but, you know, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are sometimes used to treat dysautonomia. Right. Because we only have so many <laughs> drugs that work on the nervous system. So a lot of times, you know, they they do use antidepressants to treat pain and to treat other neurological conditions. Oh, totally. Yeah. And, you know, and the other thing is that, like, I'm not, you know, I, I do have several anxiety disorders that were also undiagnosed at that point. And, you know, they, the the Lexapro made my anxiety better, too. So, you know, so even though, like, I was being treated for the wrong thing, um, I still felt better and was able to ignore, you know, the brewing medical crisis <laughs> for, you know, maybe four more years after that. Right. Yeah, that sounds familiar. And, th- and then the other thing is, since it's genetic, like, having having poor health was actually pretty normative in my family. Right, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I never really considered myself that hypermobile. Yeah, me neither. I, I, you know, I had friends that were 
gymnasts and ballerinas and stuff <laughs> who had trained for hypermobility. So compared to them, when I started reading about EDS after being diagnosed with POTS, I was like, oh, I don't, I mean, my thumb bends like that, but I don't think I'm really hypermobile. Exactly. You know, yeah. I never do like a perfect split. Like, yeah. never mind that, you know, my range of motion on my head is, like, way beyond 180 <laughs> degrees. Or... Yeah, a doctor yeah. recently, when he was examining my hypermobility, told me it was it was, it was was just about good enough to play uh, the lead in The Exorcist. Hypermobility <laughs> in my neck. I was Amazing. Like, oh, okay. That's fun. Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, I, yeah, that is fun. And that's also really relevant for, uh, for Halloween time, I think. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Comes in handy about once a year. <laughs> Yeah. Um, oh, and then, you know, and then the other, uh, but I want to say the other thing that was, you know, kind of going on with my family is that, um, you know, my parents were, you know, they had grown up middle class, but their parents hadn't necessarily, um, you know, they were children of the Great Depression or immigrants. So there was really kind of like a push towards self-sufficiency. Mm hmm. Um, so even though, so on one hand, it was like normal to feel terrible all the time, but on the other hand, like you really had to like push through it and succeed anyway. Yeah. Also very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I just, I love talking to other people who've had like this kind of experience of undiagnosed chronic illness and progressive disability because it really makes me feel like it's not you know it wasn't just me there are, there are right since this happened this isn't my fault like, exactly this isn't my family's fault like these are large you know kind of sociological factors that are really you know affecting lots of people oh for sure I mean that's that's pretty much entirely the reason that I started the show like I am fascinated by this stuff and I love to ask people really invasive questions about their health and <laughs> um, and I'm, I am so interested in how cultural attitudes kind of shape our attitudes about health and illness and life and death and that sort of thing and it's it's just been really fascinating to you know, be able to ask people about that stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, at least for me, a huge part of coming to terms with being chronically ill and, you know, disabled is kind of questioning those assumptions that, mm -hmm. you know, that we're all that we grew up, you know, hearing or that, you know, people continue to make, you know, growing up, like, you know, I, I want to be clear that, like, you know, I was, I was very lucky. My parents loved me. They took me to the doctor. You know, we had the resources for that. But, you know, my, they, they'd tell me, stop fetching, stop complaining, you know, or you're being a hypochondriac. Mm -hmm. You know, like, no, you know, <laughs> like, even though you're losing feeling in your pinkies, you're, you're okay. Trust me, you're not having a stroke. You know, because that was the only reason I knew of that you could lose feeling in your hands. Right. No one was talking about, you know, cervical radiculopathy to an 11-year-old. Right. <laughs> yeah, so there was just a lot of like, oh, no, I don't want to be a hypochondriac. Better keep quiet about all these terrible things that are starting to happen with my body. How has this all affected your relationship with your family? Um, so it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, like it kind of put my childhood in better perspective for my parents too, not just mm -hmm. me. Um, but you know, so one thing that happened is that, uh, about a year after my initial EDS diagnosis, um, and a couple months after I first became really sick with postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, um, my dad was diagnosed with a recurrence of his cancer. Mm -hmm. So uh, for the next half year, um, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, with my family, um, you know, being there for my dad. Uh, and uh, he died that summer. But, you know, I think that kind of having those things happen in really quick succession created this weird kind of... <sighs> Like, it was a big, tangled mess of emotion. Yeah. I was going to say vortex. <laughs> yeah, it was a huge vortex. Yeah. Like, I didn't actually, like, I didn't actually cope with my own. Yeah, because you have no time to like, process any of that stuff. Like, there's just so much going on. Yeah, it was like, yeah, I'm dizzy, but, like, I'm, you know, I'm just going to be sleeping in this chair in the hospital room now anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> um, you know, and I was, like, actually kind of glad that I wasn't 
it, you know, I wasn't able to work right. and it actually, you know, freed up some, you know, a lot of time for me to be with my family. Yeah, that's good. Uh, but also, you know, kind of delayed my own diagnosis just because yeah. I was, you know, not that into my own medical stuff right then. But, you know, so that, so like, you know, that was just like a huge change for my family. Um, you know, cause I grew up with a, a very tight nuclear family, you know, my mom, my dad, my brother and me, um, you know, and that was a huge change to the family. Um, and you know, and I think in a lot of ways we are closer now. Uh, and you know, I think, I think it's been like, you know, really good to just kind of have the truth finally. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's hard to separate, you know, what happened to me from what happened to my dad. Yeah. Um, and I think that's also why I, like, kind of jumped on the opportunity to do some advocacy. <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, my dad, you know, was gone and I you know, really didn't want to, like, deal with my own stuff. <laughs> it's like, you know, if I, you know clear, clearly someone who's, who's uh, coordinating a support group has to be okay, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, look, I'm helping other people. I'm totally fine. <laughs> so I think there's, like, kind of an element of, like, um, you know, uh, you know, just don't let me think about my own problems. Right. Um, but there's, like, you know, you have to balance that, you know, because I do need to get medical treatment, but I also need to, you know, take a break from, you know, thinking about that all the time. Right. Because there's so much more to think about than that. Yeah. Yeah. Have any of your friends disappeared on you? Um, you know, no one, I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't say so, but, you know, I also had, like, pretty, like, a pretty tight group of friends beforehand, Mm -hmm. um, and I'd gone through some really, like, ridiculous medical things in my 20s that were unrelated to Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I had a, uh, I had a tumor removed at one point. It was benign, but it was huge. Um, and pressing on my internal organs. Oh, that's uh, fun. Yeah. I found one in my jaw when they uh, removed <laughs> yeah. my, my wisdom teeth. They were like, yeah, we, we pulled it out. We were surprised it was there. If, it kept, if we didn't find it, it would have broke your jaw. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> thanks. What were all those x-rays for then? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd gone to one gynecologist who was like, lots of people have bad periods. And then the next one yeah. was like, holy shit, you have a 10 centimeter tumor. <laughs> oh my God. Um, so, so let's say that like the friends who'd like stuck around through that were already <laughs> like the kind that were down with gross medical shit. Yeah. Um, and you know, I'm just, you know, I have a, a very close friend. Um, I've known her since college uh, we immediately clicked. Um, uh, she lives in Vermont now, but you know, we talk on the internet, um, all the time. Uh, the internet is, I can't imagine being, uh, sick and disabled before this. Um, it's unimaginable. Yeah. Uh, that must've been really isolating. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, so we talk frequently and, you know, we see each other when we can and, um, you know, I'm just really lucky to have, you know, an amazing spouse who, uh, you know, always is there to remind me that my value as a person is not my value, you know, is not the value of my paycheck, mm-hmm. uh, which is not very good these days. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, and, you know, when, because it's, there's a lot of internalized ableism that you have oh, to Oh, for <laughs> sure. For sure. Yeah, but he's really good with, like, the capitalist side of things, you know, <laughs> so, you know, like, no, you're you're worth so much. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I'm just, yeah. And then I also, um, you know, I, I live in a city. A lot of my friends are in walking distance, so I'm able to stay in touch with them. Um, and then also, you know, even though there are people who have lost touch with, uh, you know, especially cause we don't really have like similar interests anymore. You know, people who are still like traveling and going out things and doing things that aren't just like sleeping or activisting. Um, my two favorite activities, uh, but, um, but I've made like, you know, some really, you know, amazing new friends, uh, you know, who are also disabled and or chronically ill. Nice. Um, yeah. So, uh, no, the, the new people are, are great. And, you know, I still definitely have, you know, some old people in my life 
But, you know, I think, I think as you get older, your friends are always going to change. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's not like there was anyone close to me who, you know, said something appalling and then disappeared from my life. Uh, and I know many people who that has happened to. Yeah. So I, I count my blessings. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I think I, have, I know some good folk. <laughs> My sick friends and I play a game called Try Not to Throw Up on Regional Rail. Which we, basically, it just consists of us like texting each other, like, I'm trying not to throw up on the train. Um, so funny. Yeah, I, you know, sick person humor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's really funny. Can you give me a snapshot of a time where someone said or did something really clueless or inconsiderate about your medical condition? <laughs> Uh, All but one person has laughed at that question. (laughs) Um, Recently, I was uh, at synagogue with my mom for Yom Kippur, uh, and an older woman um, came up to me. I was wearing a uh, cervical collar and my wrist braces and walking with a cane, and she asked me, uh, like, oh, were you in an accident? (laughs) I said, no, I have a genetic disorder. She said, oh, that's terrible, and she just walked away. (laughs) Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, I <laughs> think. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like, I get, I have people, like, you know, pray for me on the bus, um, which is okay. I mean, you know, I, I don't have time to, like, you know, tell them about the social model of disability uh, before my spot, and I'll just say thank you. Right. Um, like, don't pray for me. Pray for, <laughs> pray for like, you know, accessible taxi cabs or... Okay. <laughs> Pray yeah. that people finally understand that accessibility means more than ramps. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's like a pretty benign instance, but it was just so funny. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. What do you beat yourself up for? Um, mostly everything. <laughs> um, but I'm working on that with my psychologist. That's good. Yeah. Therapy is important. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that gets me out of the house on a weekly basis. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I just you know, I have a I have a tendency to blame everything on myself and to compare myself to you know some unattainable image of perfection. Um, but I'm uh, you know, I, I still have the impulse to beat myself up, but at least I can check myself now and be like, wait, realistic goals. Yeah. Yeah. I always, when I find myself, you know, engaging in negative self-talk, yep. I will, um, like, I'll stop and I'll ask myself, if I were speaking to a friend of mine or a loved one, would I ever say anything like this to them? Or would I even think this about them? And the answer, unequivocally, 100% of the time is no. So then I, I try and stop and I'll, I'll say, like, if you wouldn't say it to somebody else, you can't say it to yourself. Yes, uh, I, that's that's a really good strategy. I'm yeah. gonna have to try to. I'm gonna try to do it more. Yeah. I've had people tell me it, uh, but you know, it's it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, I mean, I've been trying to do this for a couple of years, and it's still uh, yeah. not quite automatic yet. <laughs> yeah, practice, practice. <laughs> yeah. Um, but sometimes, sometimes I just think I'm positively awesome. I, I think go back and forth. Yeah. Like it's not, it's not all the time. Well, that's good. You have a balance. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I'm beating myself up for things. Sometimes I think I'm pretty awesome. So, <laughs> you know, I, I have moods. Uh, what are the goals or priorities that you have for the management of your condition? Um, right now I just need, uh, I, I just need someone to tell me about my neck. I need a couple of uh, opinions, and I need my neck fixed. Or not fixed. I need to know. Yeah. Um, but I mean, like, long term, I want to, you know, maximize my, you know, my abilities for as long as possible, you know, without dedicating my entire, you know, conscious waking life to it. Um, you know, to me, it's all about, like, finding kind of that sweet spot mm-hmm. where you are you know, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not in denial. Like, I I think about this every day. I, I can't not think about it. I take, you know, I take meds several times a day. Um, you know, I have to put my bones back in when I wake up. Yeah, it's not something you can just ignore. 
and be yeah. like, I'm totally fine. <laughs> exactly. Like, I did that for long enough. Right. Probably did a lot of damage. We yeah. probably shouldn't do that anymore. Um, but, I, yeah, I guess my long-term goal is just, you know, finding balance and, you know, kind of continuing to, you know, redefine what it means to be, like, a contributing member of society mm -hmm. uh, when paying work is maybe not on the table anymore. Right. Yeah. And, you know, just to continue to feel, you know, like I'm doing something. <laughs> and yes. by doing something, I mean fighting ableism. Yes. <laughs> you know, wherever it may be. Yes. What advice would you give to somebody who is still undiagnosed? Take to the internet. <laughs> uh, and, you know, don't, and start looking for people who have had similar experiences to you. Because... Mm -hmm. I mean, the information is out there, uh, and I know lots of people who have, you know, either found, uh, you know, what they have on the internet, or, you know, they've found, you know, they've gotten a, you know, a recommendation for a doctor who can figure things out. Right. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, I would say, like, um, you know, try to be patient. Like, it might be a really long haul, mm. and you can... You don't have to wait until you're diagnosed to try to manage your condition. Yeah. Yeah, that's good advice. Uh, which some of it is probably the same answer to this question, which is what <laughs> advice would you give somebody who was just diagnosed this morning? Take me to the internet <laughs> and find people with your condition and read all you can. Yeah. Um, you know, people say, like, don't read it because it's scary. Yeah. I, I like to know. I mean, if you know that you're the kind of person who doesn't like to know, I guess you shouldn't read things. Yeah. But really, like, I recommend, like, you know, trying to learn as much as possible um, so that you can be an informed patient and an active participant in, like, deciding what kind of care you want. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, you know, there are amazing patient communities out there who can support you. And probably tell you more about your disorder than your doctor can. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess the answer to all the questions is internet. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for interviewing me. Thanks for listening to In Sickness and In Health. Find resources and more from us at InSicknessPod.com and on social media at InSicknessPod. And don't forget to be excellent to yourselves and each other. 